Okay, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> cracking on with the uh, final session before uh, lunch. Talking about dry bulk feels a little bit like the Last Supper. Um, but uh, let's um, just really, I, I want to show a few slides. Um, nice, um, nice presentation from Dalibor there. And I echo uh, effectively most of what he says, but I'd like to just give a few slides of my own just to set the, uh, the, the shipbroker's view of uh, the market. Okay, for those of you who have not seen one of these before, you are very privileged. Um, what we're showing there is the dry cargo market over the last 15 years or so. Uh, you can see the period um, uh, before 2003, 2002. I often call it 2002 BC, before China. Um, and we can see just uh, how awful the market is in, in a recent historic context in this slide. More contemporary data shows us the steady decline uh, of the markets through 2015 to where we are uh, at present. Now what really sets this apart from what we have seen in previous downturns, particularly the one in 2012, is that that was clearly due to oversupply. Demand in 2012 was still there, um, but we have seen, obviously, in recent uh, months, demand fall off as well. And that is clearly um, down to, to what's going on in China in many respects. We can see uh, the re reassessment of the Chinese economy uh, away from one that has been historically developed through infrastructure and growth, building ports, railways, factories, apartments, you name it, with uh, construction accounting for almost 60% of Chinese steel consumption. That has been one of the key drivers. You know, the speculators have gone, um, and uh, the construction market has just taken a little bit of a breather. Um, and what we are seeing is China move towards a more domestic demand, a consumerized and capitalist type uh, society. But if, uh, if you think that that's going to happen in the next few months, then think again. It took the US nearly 100 years to get to, through that transition, uh, from building the railways across the prairies to the west versus the consumerized market of the 1950s. You know, there's a fair few years and a couple of world wars in between that phase. Um, so don't expect a rapid turn in China. But this is having, obviously, a direct impact onto Chinese steel consumption, which has, in our uh, 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 sort of forecast, reached a peak um, and is now on a more moderated level. That, in turn, is obviously impacting Chinese steel production. Uh, but as Dalibor touched upon there, um, that whilst the domestic consumption of uh, steel has been uh, falling in the last couple of years, steel production has, uh, on the whole, held up quite nicely, uh, apart from the last four or five months or so. Um, and what uh, Dalibor mentioned was the putting into the market the excess supply of steel uh, and the dumping accusations that are currently in the headlines today. Um, what has not really helped the dry bulk market is just the way that Australia has responded to um, the imports required uh, of iron ore by China. Um, what you can see here is a, is a very relatively stable picture of iron ore imports um, into China from both Brazil and Australia. The long haul uh, voyages of, from Brazil have been relatively static year on year in the last three or four years, whereas Australia, through its expansion programs of Rio Tinto, BHP, FMG, have responded to Chinese needs. And of course, that's more of a short haul, um, in, in, certainly in regards to 
uh, the Brazilian trade. Not, not necessarily good for the ton mile. Um, also touched upon was the falling of the Chinese uh, coal imports. What we saw there, really down to uh, a fall off in demand, but also more hydro uh, capacity coming on stream. And overall, total dry bulk trade actually declined in 2015 by 0.3 of a percent. Let's call it static, shall we? We're amongst friends. Um, but we are looking, hopefully, for a small increase uh, this year, around about 2 to 2.5%. Two so nothing spectacular, and certainly not with regards to the growth in the fleet. Talking of the fleet, what we can see here in the blue bars is the month-on-month -month, um, deliveries versus the scrappings in green below the line. Now, because these are month by month, or month on month uh, growth, uh, sorry, additions, then the cumulative effect is quite horrific in terms of how the fleet has grown. So what you can see there is there's only been two very short periods in the last four or five years where the fleet has actually contracted. It has been systematic growth essentially every month. What this has meant in terms of supply and demand, and this is one of those uh, wonderful supply and demand uh, graphs that was mentioned in the pre previous uh, presentation. Um, for those who may be smart, we actually keep the forecasting bit for our clients, so you can't have that. But what you can see is just the extent of which the supply has grown in more recent years, and whilst the uh, demand has been positive. It's, it's been the last uh, two quarters or so that has really seen demand fundamentally for the Cape sector take a breather and has been also static. That has just obviously increased the difference between supply and demand and hence the impact on rates. Um, so what's the industry doing about it? Well, it's trying to scrap its way out is essentially the first reaction. The good news from a market perspective is we have seen a record month in dry bulk history. January, almost six million dead weight gone and so for scrap. Um, we're looking at uh, Braemar's ACM's research forecast for this year is 39 million dead weight. That's our forecast. That would make it a record year. Put it into context, we saw 35 and a half million dead weight scrapped in 2012. We saw 30 million dead weight last year. So 39 million will be a significant increase on last year. And oh my God, the, the market needs it. Um, but the upside is, of course, that ships are now cheap. And if there's anybody in the audience that's got a lot of cash, then we'll be happy to uh, sell you a ship. And um, you can see there, that in a recent historical context, just how cheap the ships are, but it's even more impressive if you adjust for inflation and put everything in today's market uh, levels. Um, and you can see there that we are seeing Camsomaxes, Panamaxes, in essence, the cheapest they have been for 30 odd years. So, with those few thoughts in mind, I'd like now, like now to sort of involve um, and hand over to our esteemed uh, panel, we have Giovanni Rano from Bungie Group. We have uh, Sab, uh, Seb Landerecht from uh, Louis Dreyfus and uh, uh, Jean-Michael Radisville from CTM. Correct. Um, I should say C Transportes Maritimes. Or CTM. Oh, okay. <laughs> Why not? Okay, gentlemen, let me just uh, ask you, um, if I may, um, we, we all forecast oversupply in the markets uh, when we saw the extent of the order book developing in 2013-2014. So we, we shouldn't be too surprised at the extent of this weak market, but obviously what we have seen is the falling off of demand. How much do you consider that the fall off in demand is to contribute for this pretty awful situation the dry bulk market is in today. Giovanni, if I may start with you. Um, 
Well, um, clearly the demand has been accelerating um, the pace uh, of late. Uh, and I think the two combined factor uh, makes it the market that we have today. Um, as to the forecastability of the demand, I think some of it was possible, um, some was not. Um, but but I, I think the most important for the shipping industry is uh, how do we see the transition going? Um, uh, some very pessimistic um, economists out there say that uh, we're going to basically be flat growing for the next foreseeable future, five, seven years, um, on the back of you know, weakish uh, and problematic economies in the emerging markets in China. You know, India cannot put it back together and therefore will not be able to grow. Um, we are definitely not as pessimistic. Clearly, there is, to our understanding, no solution in 2016, probably no meaningful solution either for the first half of next year. Um, so the job will have to be done on the supply side, really. Uh, I'm probably jumping towards the end of the view, but uh, the, the demand has been a real issue, um, and unfortunately it has been aggravating a rather burdensome situation already. Thank you. Seb, uh, Lou Dreyfus, uh, are they seeing the, f the fall in, in demand on a very significant level? Not necessarily. I think uh, demand overall has, has kept a, a rather historically steady and robust uh, pace. Of course, we can argue that the call uh, uh, flow to China has been a, a disaster, but uh, if you put all in all, it's still a growing a uh, couple of percentage. Uh, you still have very strong uh, bean uh, flow to, to China. The ags are quite strong. Iron ore, um, because of the quality that was mentioned earlier, still flowing to China despite the peak steel. Um, what is not consumed in China for steel is exported. So it's not completely catastrophic. The question is really what's the next really of growth as China is, is really undergoing this transition. Um, is there someone to take the baton? Obviously, uh, you have India uh, with a 6-7% growth. The problem is um, protectionism. Uh, uh, the Moody uh, um, uh, government is uh, uh, encouraging a lot of uh, domestic uh, production, and that has, uh, uh, that has been uh, uh, capping the potential for, for increase. But um, demand is so diverse when it comes to dry bulk that uh, it's very we should not uh, completely discard uh, the possibility of white elephants or blue unicorn. Ten years ago, we had Katrina, which was obviously a, a disaster, but that uh, propelled with massive cement steel flows into the market. Uh, you have um, Vietnam, that is actually the only country increasing its uh, coal base power generation from 20 to 50 percent in the next 10 years, from what I read. Uh, so there are relays of growth out there. It's not. Uh, uh, it's not f just for the sake of being contrarian, but there's always uh, strong surprises. And, and finally, for, for China, the trend on coal has been down, but the political nature of decision making in China makes uh, the possibility of an uh, overnight reversal in policies to, to pick over seaborne versus domestic, it's a likelihood. It's mm -hmm. a low likelihood, but the impact would be massive. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's a good point. And, and to be honest, you only need to see a dry season to deplete the hydro capacity, Correct. and that could change almost overnight. Uh, Jean-Michael, um, what's your thoughts on the contribution that the demand picture is playing on the markets today? I would say less than supply. Supply has been the real issue. Um, supply is what I prefer to focus on because it's something we... Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, supply is what I would prefer to focus on in general because it's something we as ship owners can do something about. We haven't been very good about it in the past, but now we are starting to get it. Scrapping ships, not ordering new ones, um, canceling new buildings, dare I say it where possible, and also slow your ships down. I mean, on the demand side, the, everything besides coal is not that bad, and as my friend says, coal can come back pretty quickly and it's such a small percentage of the Ch Chinese coal imports, sorry, can come back pretty quickly if you think about the percentage of um, domestic coal versus imported coal, even in a high imported coal environment. 
So I'm, that's pretty much it for me on demand, on supply. I mean, we know what we have to do. Um, so I'm just going to go back to you just at one point there because working for a broking company, I'm an eternal optimist. So I'm going to be looking for every good sign here. Um, do you feel that with India and the coal situation there, as India's coal consumption is due to increase significantly, whilst there is the focus on trying to increase domestic production, do you think the domestic production can keep up with consumption? Um, do you think there'll be a shortfall that will encourage further imports? Uh, not an easy one, and uh, I, I think I, I don't know India so well, but from what I, I read in the news, like all of us, um, Coal India is producing at a pace of 15% year on year, and they account for 80% of the production. Uh, again, it's, it's, a, it's a political decision. If you want to support your domestic uh, mining uh, uh, sector, uh, then uh, all incentives uh, will weigh on the balance and, uh, and make it uh, economic. Then on the coking coal, I think there was yesterday in the news, uh, we're talking about $4 billion in investment for uh, the sector in India. Uh, problem is quality of uh, coking coal is more than steam coal, I impurity, ashes, and uh, I think here it's not as easy as it looks um, to, to replace seaborne. Uh, uh, okay, thank you. Giovanni, um, we touched upon there the, the transition in my presentation to of the Chinese economy uh, to one of more uh, consumer-driven demand. I, is that going to be um, a uh, a transition we're going to be talking about for many years, and how do you think it will impact on the drivable markets? Um, not an easy question. Uh, I think the transition in China is there to stay. Um, I think the political will of the government is clearly pushing towards that. So this is not a this is not a one shot right now in the dark. I really think it you know it's a continuous effort that they're going to do. But as Seb was saying, you know. We, people don't really focus on that, but the demand keeps growing. Uh, China keeps growing. Um, definitely more problematic right now, and you know probably a lot slower than they actually officially say. Um, but it's a, it's still a massive engine of economy. So um, not to cheer you up, but uh, there's hope for brokers going forward um, <laughs> and owners. Um, so. Definitely, I think you know it, it will be bumpy. It will be a, you know probably a couple of years where um, I think we're paying the price of you know overinvesting really, not the transition. Uh, so I don't think the transition in itself is the big issue. Uh, the pace of growth will clearly be slower. Uh, you know I think we have grown over 20 percent year on year. I think Seb, you, you would say on the on the steel uh, complex in China. So that's not repeatable anytime soon. But um, it, it keeps on growing, and so are the emerging countries. So right now, everything is clouded because we have a massive overcapacity, uh, and the, 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 the oversupply, uh, you know, the last five, six years, we're paying that price today. Uh, so it's kind of shadowed, but um, I, I think it's not going to be a big issue in itself. If I may add, it's, um, Xi Jinping's cabinet uh, has, has a very strong political view of vision. It's, they have been taking very hard uh, decisions when it comes to lay off, laying off uh, iron ore, coal mining workers, We're talking the, the scale of two, three millions over the past few years, which is something that we all in the past few years used to consider as an impediment to reforms and it's actually happening. There is certainly a lot of tensions in China, but in the end, they are tackling the overcapacity. They are going at it. Um, probably uh, the currency will be uh, the, the main uh, tool instead of uh, a heavy uh, a la 2008 uh, fiscal stimulus, which is not repeatable. Yeah. It would be completely contradictory with what they want to achieve, but uh, it, it, will, uh, it will bear its fruit. And it's good to see a country like China taking its time and not overreacting on the short term. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the supply side now, uh, John Absolutely. Michael. Absolutely. Yeah, let's talk supply. So, Mass layups, inevitable, or just go straight to the beaches? Um, yeah. Both is both. the answer, uh, and the more the merrier at this point. I think it's an owner's responsibility if he has he or she has a ship that's over a certain age to take it right to the beach. Um, I also think he has a responsibility vis-a-vis -vis layups if rates are too low to just lay up his ships because you get to a point where it's just not safe to carry cargo at those rates. 
but we, we are seeing the chatter on the number of cold layups start to increase, particularly in the last month or so. Did you think cold layups is the answer, or is it just idling and inefficient? I think scrapping is the answer. Um, I think cold layups are a short-term solution and a necessary solution in this rate environment, but no, scrapping is the answer. You've got to get supply out of the market forever. Well, we, we, we saw three 14-year-old Panamaxes got scrapped last month. I guess we've got to see a lot more of that. Absolutely. Um, we, we, should, we should definitely see a lot more of that, and we, we owe it to ourselves to do more of that. The other thing I will touch on on the supply side is actually slowing down your ships. Low bunker environment, okay, great. You can go faster now, but you're destroying your own market. I mean... <laughs> Giovanni, what, what do you think on uh, the supply response? Scrapping or layup? The industry needs to scrap. There's no uh, you know, layups. It's um, sh short term medicament that will make the industry feel better for a few months, for maybe for, for until the end of the year if they go really massive. But I, definitely not the solution. And in fact, I think the discipline in scrapping is what owners need to, you know, to establish. Um, and I'm not even sure the economics for layup are really there because right now the returns, no matter how low they are uh, on period basis, are a better proposition than layup. So I, I think that's definitely not what owners should do. Okay. All right. Well, I, I gave you my figure for the year of 39 million for demolition. May I ask the panel for your prediction? Giovanni. Seb. Oh. No, we, we don't have a hard knock number simply because uh, it's, the dynamics can be very, very erratic. Um, still, pr scrap price is a massive component of it, of course. Uh, here, the last uh, done was close to 200. Okay, when you need to scrap, I guess you, you just go ahead and scrap. Uh, but, uh, it's better than uh, negative cash flow, right? No. <laughs> um, capacity, global capacity of scrapping, I think 2012 you mentioned was probably the peak. So how many other ship types need to be scrapped? There is the capacity for sure. So technically you got 10% of the fleet, which is probably more than 1,000 uh, units that are over 20 year old. Um, so mm. that's 50% uh, of that, call it 500 uh, units. It's probably 35 million back of the envelope calc. Is it enough? Probably not, but comes next year. Supply is a, is a slow uh, predicament. I agree that uh, lay, uh, layup is just a Damocles sword that hangs out there ready to, to fall. But there are other, the invisible supply like congestion, speed yeah. you mentioned, uh, absolutely uh, speeding, uh, speeding uh, up, uh, accelerated the fleet. There is less congestion, better uh, terminals. All that created a real fleet supply that is massive. So um, scrap, I, I think mid 30s uh, million dead weight is uh, possible. Okay, John Mark, do you have a number in your mind? Uh, no, but I have an answer. More than you think, less than you hope. Uh, <laughs> I think that's life will stop, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so we're hoping for a lot of scrapping. We know there will be a lot of scrapping. How is that going to help? in terms of the market recovery. What, what shape is the market recovery going to take? You know, how long do we have to wait? And is it sustainable? G Giovanni. Well, I think the, the, the answer will really reside in the audience. Uh, I, I think, the, as I mentioned before, I don't think the demand uh, has, except for, um, for uh, un, you know, unplanned events, catastrophic event perhaps, uh, or a government that would inject a lot of money in the system. I don't think the demand is any time a solution over the next year or two. Um, so the, the action on the supply is what's going to dictate how the market's going to behave. Um, we believe that we can have a lot more scrapping than what you're currently figuring. Um, and the function of that scrapping, so well in excess of 38, 40 million, it is really a function of what owners will do. If they decide to, to, to opt for uh, layups, then we won't have that much scrapping. And then we're gonna have probably a little bit more volatility, but you know, we think that the pain will endure, will be longer. Uh, so for at least a couple of years, unless they, they keep vessel uh, in layup for a couple of years, in which case it might be sustainable. But otherwise layups are not a 
long-term sustainable effect. And to the recovery of the markets, we believe we're going to have a tough 16 and probably somewhat of a tough 17 uh, and somewhere around 17, depending on how disciplined the industry is. We're going to start recovering, which doesn't mean we go to um, you know, equilibrium positive cash flow and above break even, but we'll trend towards that. And it could be fast if we help with some of the demand. And the, the more, the better, as you said. So the more disciplined, the better, I think, for the industry. That's that's what we need. So the, the more we see consolidation and and discipline around that, the faster we're going to recover. A couple of years out okay. is what it is. It's, it's amazing how our reference points change. We're now talking about OPEX as a recovery. Uh, but <laughs> that, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the time frame and the position we're, we're in. Mm. Seb, how's this, how's this recovery going <clears throat> to look for you? Well, it's up with the supply. Not, I don't want to reopen the, the debate, but if you scrapped uh, all the overage uh, fleet, um, half of the order book gets, uh, which is 1,500 vessels, uh, gets uh, cancelled um, or delayed or converted in, into other ship types. Then after a couple of years, you can uh, you can expect rebalancing. Then it's the eternal question: What is the the balance, the equilibrium of price? What's the function of the market economically to uh, to guarantee to the risk takers who are the ship owners? So they are the one taking a risk, investing. Market must guarantee a certain. Uh, margin for that once it's but it's a bit of a chicken and an egg question when you talk to the FFA for what curve and the spot uh, what uh, drives what but uh, we have to observe that today uh, the FFA curve is below OPEX until 2018 that does send quite quite a message doesn't it um, at the same time I liked very much this morning's remark that if you are optimistic keep it for yourself I thought that was brilliant um, and yes it becomes a prisoner's dilemma where if you see a bit of uh, recovery everybody jumps in hopefully the market I don't like the concept of discipline necessarily we are individual we take our own rational even uh, passionate decision sometimes um, but uh, hopefully this market stays low for a sufficient amount of time to guarantee a steady recovery to levels where it's not going to be an explosion, but at least there is uh, decent margins for, for everybody. And I think this market not necessarily has the space for too many operators. I think a certain amount of good relationship between principals and sound, and sound cargo based operators with a strong risk management is necessary to keep this market robust and healthy mm. and avoid. Uh, I think that's, I think that's a, a sort of a message that keeps coming through from where I'm here in time and time again. The, 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 the greater the short-term pain, the better the long-term gain. And I think that's what we really need to talk, think about 16. I mean, uh, we just get the year over with, scrap a lot of ships, and then, John Michael, how is your recovery well, looking? First of all, I prefer to have high rates right now, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, now, uh, the answer is I don't know. But if ship owners take some self-help measures, and self-help is not going to look for more money to pay for new builds or whatever your ongoing business, self-help is scrapping older ships, self-help is not ordering new ones, canceling existing orders where you can, and slowing down your ships, then you can have a recovery sooner than we think. But we all have to stay disciplined. And here's the other thing, as my friend says, let's not get too excited when it does get back. And Actually, I think we can get excited, but don't get excited towards new supply. There's enough ships out there so you can just buy one of those if you really need to. Right. Okay, well, we've got uh, a few uh, minutes left um, be before lunch to uh, throw uh, the panel to the questions of the audience. So can I please uh, ask for some questions? Do we have a microphone? Microphone, anyone? There's a gentleman at the end. Okay, yeah. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, John Michael, for your views uh, and uh, advice. What happens if you are stuck in this bad market with a fairly young vessel? What is your advice in this situation? Because I think, you know, reason 
does lend itself to your prescription of, you know, if you're over 10, 15 years old, maybe you should pack it in. If you have an asset with a long life ahead of it, caught in a very negative cash flow situation, wh what would you propose? That's a big part of the market right now. Thanks. Well, you could do one of two things. You could do, as my friend uh, Giovanni says, you fix it out on period, take the pain, or if you're a one chip owner, you put it into a commercial management system with more volume and scale in the market to try and lift up your average while keeping the same flexibility as you would in the spot market. Thank you. So, Giovanni, anything to add to that question? No, I, uh, chips. <laughs> we, we, uh, I think it's just manage your cash burn and, you know, I guess right here, right now, it's about defending uh, whichever strategy works. Uh, obviously, being cost effective, being, you know, good at running your, your operation is the, obviously the first thing and I'm sure everybody's doing that, so it goes without saying, but there is no real magic in extract additional revenues. So make sound projections on what the next couple of years are gonna be in terms of revenues and, and then cascade your decision from there on. There's unfortunately not a lot more uh, magic. Maybe just to rebound the question regarding the young fleet. I think there's a, there was a big missed opportunity uh, of uh, uh, having some of the fleet differentiate itself through the quality on a 60 70 dollar barrel price and um, unfortunately or not i mean we we, uh, we haven't had this opportunity to see all design non-economic non-eco design vessel being almost naturally through the evolution of the uh, of their competitiveness being left aside and $30 per, per barrel kind of uh, no le echo. levels everybody and but it, if we go back to 60 70 then yes some younger tonnage will not be competitive and potentially get kicked out that's a big if works for me no. <laughs> yeah okay we've got time for one more question Hi, um, just one question. We're all talking about uh, scrapping and reducing the supply, but do you think that there is enough scrapyard capacity or even if there is appetite from the scrapyards to take uh, more ships? Because we're talking about, some people say 30, 35, 50 million tons per year, but that's not enough to bring down the supply enough to meet demand. So even if let's say all owners of older vessels suddenly decide to scrap their tonnage. Do you think that the scrap yard capacity is there? Thanks. Yes. Anybody? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, you do. Yes, I do. We, 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 we scrapped 30, 30, 36 million in 12. See no reason why we couldn't scrap a higher number yeah, this year. The industry in 2012 scrapped uh, about 60 million dead weight. Um, give or take, and that doesn't actually tell you this is the maximum capacity. You know, we, we probably could have scrapped more. So, is it doable? Y yes, it is. You, this year, you're probably going to face no competition from tanker, which is a good thing. Back then, you, you did. Um, you do have competition from containers, obviously, uh, to a certain extent, but I think it's a different kind of competition and different type of ships. Um, so I think it's definitely possible to be actually well above 40 million dead weight. Um, and I think the decision really more to, to, to the question before is depending on how you want to manage, manage your, your portfolio and do you want to you know, get out and cash in what's left of it and manage your cash burn, you want to lay up or just incur the pain and you know, in the hope that in six months time it's better. I would discourage that, that, that last option, but uh, um, you know you need a little bit more time than that. But I think it is definitely possible. Thanks. But but to your point, f f 38, 40, 45, or 50 million won't solve the equation either. So we probably need a couple of years of that to, assuming the demand remain at a standstill for the next two years. 35, 40 million won't solve the equation. 
So very good that we see seven million in, in one month. Hopefully we see 40 or 50 million this year, but it won't be enough. It will be trending towards a, re, a rebalancing, but it, will, it won't achieve any rebalancing yet. So, thank you, panel. We have uh, finished on time. Uh, the general summary is recovery at the earliest 2017, maybe 2018. But the recovery needs scrapping, cancellations, but we have got uh, a moderately increasing demand picture, although nothing spectacular in demand. So, a difficult 2016 in dry bulk. Discipline. That's the word, discipline. Take away that from this session and enjoy your lunch. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.